for those of you who this is your first time at the family, I want to have a little quick introduction about what we do. Uh, it's all in the name. We are a family for entrepreneurs. We provide them with an infrastructure of education, services, and eventually capital to help them grow their startups. Uh, our structure is quite unique in the early stage world in that we don't have a program. It's not like an incubator or an accelerator. Instead, you come into the family, you look around, you see what we have on offer, and you take what you want. You ask when you need something, and we see if we can deliver. Uh, we do that with a team of 30 plus people now with offices across Paris, Berlin, and London. Uh, and those, our team ranges from entrepreneurs to uh, graphic designers, to content experts, to legal advice, anywhere where we think that we can add value for our entrepreneurs. We also have a series of independent companies that we refer to as our BFFs, uh, who provide services to the ecosystem at large. So this is things like Lion, uh, where we're training the next generation of startup employees, uh, Kimono, which are culture designers, and uh, Coup d'etat, for example, is online videos about entrepreneurship. When the family started in 2013, education was really the base that we placed everything on. And that's remained the same ever since. Uh, and that's why we do events like the one here tonight, where we have founders, key employees, service providers, and others come out to share about their experiences. We're also very interested in the state of our world as we move into this digital age. Uh, we've all been living in a world and in an economy that was basically designed in the wake of the Great Depression and when Fordist factories were essentially the main driver of the economy, or at least that was how we conceived of them. And it's pretty clear now that as we're into this digital age that there are breaking points that are coming up on us very quickly and those are political, economic, and certainly environmental. Uh, and that's why I'm really glad to have Kate here tonight. Uh, she's been described as a renegade economist which I really like for the personal branding aspect. Uh, that's great. Uh, I hope that after, after having read the book, I have to say I hope that it doesn't stick uh, because I don't actually think that what, is, what she's proposing, what she's talking about, should be seen as particularly renegade. Um, the real question that she poses is how can we go from thinking how can we get our economy to grow to how can we have an economy that helps us thrive? That seems like something that we can all pretty much get behind. And her answer, which lies in the visual of the donut, which I'm sure she will uh, explain quite a bit more, uh, is based in the need to rewrite these metrics that we use to talk about and understand our economy, uh, to get away from the worshiping of GDP, and instead to start thinking about, OK, how can we take into account both human needs and planetary boundaries? Uh, it is a fascinating book. I recommend that you all purchase it. We have uh, French copies that will be for sale after the talk. Uh, but for now, I'd like to hand it over to Kate uh, for her presentation on business and what is it doing in the 21st century. Thank you so much, Kyle. And uh, hi, I'm completely delighted to be here. Um, I have to just tell you one thing. I'm a jazz singer, so actually this is normally the moment at which I start to sing. I'm not going to do that, I promise. I'll stick with the economics tonight. But I'm delighted to be here because this event, I already know the family are very entrepreneurial because last Thursday evening, I realized I had a free night in Paris. So I went onto Twitter. I just wrote, Donut Calling Paris. I'm in Paris next Wednesday. Anybody want to put on a pop-up event? And within minutes, I think I got an email from, a, a tweet back from Vlad and then one from Kyle. Yeah, we will. So thank you for uh, making this connection. I now have met the family and I'm already impressed. So I'm delighted to be here. I love talking about donuts and economics and business. And that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. So I've got the clicker. Let me start with the health warning, okay? Don't eat too many of these, please. The doctors will come after me. So donuts aren't good for us. The donut I'm offering you is conceptual. You don't have to eat it. You only have to think about it, if you can resist. Oh, and while I've got it here, thank you to Plon, the French publisher of my book, which is now out in French. 
It sounds very grand, la, la terre du donut. I feel very philosophical now. So let me tell you, la terre du donut. I'm going to just kick off with this donut picture. It is a compass that I offer to you as a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. As Kyle just described, we really need a compass, given how aware we are of the rocky times around us. So this is the donut. What's going on here? Let me tell you. Imagine humanity's use of resources radiating out from the middle of this picture, which means that the hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on the essentials of life, where people don't have the food, water, healthcare, education, housing, energy, political voice, gender equality that every person in the world has a claim to. I crowdsourced these 12 social dimensions from the world's governments. They are all in the sustainable development goals. So every government in the world has already agreed that every person in the world has the right to have these met. We want to leave nobody in the hole, get everybody over that social foundation. But, and this is the big 21st century but, collectively we cannot use Earth's resources so much that we begin to go over that outer ring, that ecological ceiling, because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary, unique, delicately balanced living planet that we begin to kick our planet out of balance. We cause climate breakdown. We acidify the oceans. We create a hole in the ozone layer, critical levels of biodiversity loss. And these around the outside, these are called the nine planetary boundaries. They were drawn up by leading Earth system scientists a decade ago. They believe these are the critical nine life-supporting systems that hold Earth in the balance that she's been in for the last 11,000 years. And we, as we know, we are on the brink of pushing ourselves out of this balance into a space that humanity has never lived in before. So let me put it simply, this is a compass for meeting the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And if that's a compass, well, you want to know where, where we are. You want the KPIs, right? Here are the KPIs. All of that red shows you the extent either to which we're falling short on people's needs. For example, here, oh, that's not shiny. Okay, you see that one on food at the top? That little red wedge on food, it goes 11% of the way to the middle of the circle because 11% of people worldwide don't have enough food to eat every day. But you can see on every one of those social dimensions, there are millions, billions of people falling short on their essential needs. They live in countries rich and poor, mostly poor, but we all know that there is poverty and deprivation in the heart of Paris, London, our own rich countries. So there's extraordinary levels of human deprivation still to be eliminated, and yet, we've already overshot at least four of those planetary boundaries. On climate change, for example, that ecological ceiling is at 350 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're over 400 parts per million already and rising. We're massively over on biodiversity loss, on excessive fertilizer use, on land conversion. So I offer this to you as a snapshot of the state of humanity and our planetary home for we the people of the early 21st century. And this is our selfie. And we're the first generation to see this because this science is, is really recent and our understanding of the interdependence of human well-being and planetary well-being is very new. So we're the first generation to see this image and the scientists tell us we are probably the last with a real chance of turning it around, which is an extraordinary position to be in of opportunity, responsibility, overwhelm, and possibility. And if looking at a graph doesn't quite do it for you, let me, let me bring this home. This is not for the faint-hearted. You won't have missed last month the world's climate change scientists saying, we have about a decade to turn the situation around if we're going to keep global climate change below 1.5 degrees. 
You won't have missed just last month WWF telling us that since 1970, that's the year I was born, I'll save you the maths, I'm 48. Since 1970, the population of all other animals has fallen by 60% in my lifetime. There's plastic in the body of human beings all over the planet. Air pollution, land degradation, water shortages, phosphorus levels, ocean acidification, hitting levels not seen for 14 million years. And the richest 1% of people in the world own half of the wealth. The American writer William Burroughs said, after taking one look at this planet, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. And we have to ask ourselves, who is the manager? Perhaps we are all the managers. If this is a little depressing, let me give you the one piece of good news. NASA says the hole in Earth's ozone layer is finally closing up because humans did something about it. And of course, yes, that's worth a cheer. <laughs> but the question is, what are we gonna do about all the rest of it? Because every one of these challenges on the screen is due to what humans have or haven't done. So what are we gonna do to turn it around? I profoundly believe this is our generational challenge and the legacy for which my children, your children, your children's children will judge us and remember us and will ask us, what did you do when you already knew? So I've shown you here a, a picture of the global story, but most people won't say, yeah, but where's my country? How are we doing? So let me bring this down to the national level. Researchers at Leeds University have created 150 national donuts. If you care about a country that's not here, go to that website and there's wonderful comparisons you can see. The way they've drawn it, is you want to fill the circle in blue in the center. That means you meet everybody's needs, but you don't want to overshoot that green boundary. So let's take a country like Zambia. Average income, $4,000 per person. Hardly overshooting on those planetary boundaries, but people barely meeting their most essential needs. A lot of transformation is clearly needed there. Go to China both falling short on people's needs, already overshooting planetary boundaries. It reflects the global story that we just saw. But over here, France, almost meeting people's essential needs, falling short on employment. Remember, of course there's deprivation in France, but this is a global social threshold. It's a very, very low bar. All high income countries should be doing this. But massively overshooting on those planetary boundaries, overshooting all but one of them. And to be clear, this isn't about the resources that are mined and polluted in France, it's about all the resources that were mined and the pollution released to produce all the laptops and iPhones and lights and machines that we have. So everything that's been imported, our consumption. Let me put this on a global scale. So going up this axis is achieving those social needs in the middle but you want to do it without overshooting planetary boundaries. So you want to be in that sweet spot up there where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. But look at the world's countries. Nobody's anywhere close. Yes, you look Vietnam. But the question is, are they moving into that space or sailing right past it? And these countries down here are traditionally called developing countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. They have an extraordinary development process to go through how to meet the needs of all people without overshooting the means of the planet. If they follow what our own countries have done, obviously this is going to completely transgress the planet's boundaries. So this is an uncharted path of development. But look up here, France, the UK, where I come from, Canada, the US, Australia, Germany, all of these high income countries. I don't call this developed. I don't use the word developed countries anymore. If I hear someone saying, well, in, in developed countries, I say, please take me to a developed country. I, how on earth can we call that developed? We may have plenty of material means, but we are meeting them by literally running down the planet on which we depend. So this is a development journey too, to sustain good 
lifestyles while coming back within the means of the planet. That's never been done before. And this is the transformation, the low carbon transition that is crucially needs to happen in our countries. But then there's this group here too, China, Egypt, Turkey, South Africa, Mexico, these emerging economies, where are they going? This is just a snapshot. Are they swinging up on that old path? And what would it take for them to transform their development process so they start moving into that direction? These are three very different stories of development, but I think they're all development, which is why I say we are all developing countries now. And 21st century development is a very different concept than what we thought it was last century, merely growing the economy. It doesn't get you to where we need to be. So many things need to change in the world to actually start moving into that direction. We need to change, for sure, we need to change the way economics is taught in universities. And that's what infuriates me because it's not changing anything like fast enough. But we need to change the policies pursued by governments and we need to change business. And that's what I want to focus on today because of the interests and the focus in the family. So what does this donut mean for business? Well, I've, taught, I've presented this picture to hundreds of businesses over the last five years, from three-person social enterprise startups to Fortune 500 companies. And, and I invite them to imagine themselves, I invite you to imagine your own enterprise seated at this table and ask yourself, is the core business we're doing, not, not the nice to have philanthropy on the side, but the core business that we do, is it helping to bring humanity into this space? Is it helping to meet people's essential needs, coming back within the means of the planet? Or for most big companies, let's be honest, actually we've made a good profit by undermining many people's needs and rights, workers' rights to organize, women's rights to maternity leave. We've squeezed workers down the supply chain and we've actually pushed ourselves over the means of the planet. That's how we made a profit in the 20th century. What would it mean to turn that story around? Well, I've shared this with many different companies and some big companies have told me they've used it. Companies like these, I've either worked with them or they've said, they contacted me and said, we've actually sat with the donut on our strategy table and asked ourselves, how does this help us transform who we are? If we want to be a progressive 21st century business, how does this inform what we should do differently? But what really strikes me and fascinates me is the range of responses that I hear from companies. And I want to share that with you. And I invite you to reflect where do you think a company you love or hate is today? This is what I call the corporate to-do list because once a company has seen the donut, the question is, what are they going to do? So five, five different positions on the corporate to-do list. The first one is the oldest one, do nothing. Well, this is a sad, sad picture. But you know, the business of business is business. And everything we're doing is nearly legal. So we'll just keep going until the cost of fines exceed the profits of what we do. We can all think of companies that sit there. There's no room for that. We just don't have the time to allow business to still sit in that position. So the first step up is to do what pays now. If it saves us money, we'll cut carbon emissions in our supply chains. If, if we'll get a niche consumer market, we'll get some kind of green certification. It's starting to move in the right direction, but it's still too motivated by short-term financial returns. And we need much more ambition. So the next step up is to say, we'll do our fair share. Many big companies have been saying over the last five years, our country has committed to cutting its carbon emissions by 20% in the next 20 years. So we'll cut our carbon emissions by 20% in the next 20 years. The danger of that attitude is that anybody knows who's, who's been out to dinner with friends and everyone chips in what they think is their fair share for the bill. You don't want to be the one holding the tray when the waiter comes because it almost never adds up. And this is what's been happening in the climate change negotiations internationally. I'll do my fair share when you do your fair share, but you won't do your fair share until you think I'm doing my fair share. We never get there. Some companies have taken this actually very seriously and taken on what's called science-based targets, asking what is global scientists telling us we need to do to stay under 1.5 degrees. And that pushes them to the next level of ambition, which is to do mission zero. It turns out that your fair share 
is to cut your carbon emissions to zero by 2030 or 2040 or 2050. It goes beyond carbon. We're going to have zero polluted wastewater leaving our factories. We're going to put zero air pollution back into the city. We're going to have zero workplace accidents in our factories, zero child labor in our supply chains. This is truly ambitious because business has never been done like this before. But the regenerative designer Bill McDonough would say, why, why be 100% less bad when you could break through the ceiling of your imagination and actually do good, aim to sequester carbon, or restore the soil, or improve the health of the community, or pay better wages. Why not have the ambition of being generative, net positive? And I call this doing the donut, because there are some companies, when I show them the donut diagram, they say, wow, this is, this is like our corporate logo. This, this sums up why we're in business. This is what we're doing business for. In order to pr improve children's health, in order to clean up the air, in order to restore the soil. Let me give you some examples of what I mean by doing the donut. See, I think that there are going to be two design principles at the heart of the 21st century economy. Today, it's deeply divisive with the 1% owning half of the world's wealth, and it's degenerative, running down the living planet. So I think we need an economy that is distributive by design, and regenerative by design. And I think those principles are going to be lived out by 21st century companies that are actually doing the donor. Let me illustrate that. Let's first, distributive by design. So I've shown you some, a lot of bad news. Don't go home only with that. Here is what I think is one of the most fundamentally powerful pieces of good news this century. The technologies of how we generate and distribute energy, of communication, of how we generate and share knowledge, in the 20th century, these were centralized by design, right? Energy was from a, an oil rig, a coal mine, a gas pipeline. Every telephone call went through an operator switchboard and out the other side. And knowledge since the 1500s has been controlled by patents and copyrights. And a lot of capital had to come together. And you're talking about the, the, the Fordist factories, right? Manufacturing in a big factory in one location. Lots of big money must come together in one place to make that investment. A very centralized design. Here's my favorite toy, right? Centralized, bringing capital together in one place. Let's see if I could do a microphone and a clicker and a toy all at once. The unprecedented opportunity of the 21st century is that these technologies, for the first time in human history, are now distributed by design, right? Instead of an oil rig, you've got Whew. You've got a solar panel on the roof of every house, hospital, school, wind turbines dotted across the landscape. Instead of centralized communication, we've got the internet. And there's a node of it in every pocket in this room and in the hand of this woman in Tanzania. Who could have imagined that in the 1980s? And instead of centralized intellectual property rights in patents and, co and, and copyright, which was designed to share knowledge, but actually anyone who knows in the pharmaceutical industry, the digital industry, it's used now to protect and defend whole areas of innovation. We've got Creative Commons licensing. We've got the possibility for people to work open source as a network. These technologies have never been on the side of distribution before. This is a completely unprecedented 21st opportunity. It's one of the great pieces of news in my mind, and we have to seize it and make sure it doesn't get captured in the hands of Facebook and Google, but actually turned into distributive returns in enterprise. What about distributive design within companies themselves? Here are four examples of the ways I see some enterprises being more distributive by design. So, who owns the company? Not shareholders in some cases, but employees, Huawei phones. Interestingly, founded in China in the late 1980s, and the entrepreneur who created the company was a little nervous of how the state was going to respond to this private enterprise. So he made it employee-owned from the outset. Of course, that creates massive morale in the company. So employee ownership, the people doing the work get the returns rather than shareholders who never actually set foot in the enterprise. But it's not just returns going to those in the company, it's returns for those all the way down the supply chain. So a commitment to ethical supply chain, paying a living wage before paying a higher dividend, 
and ensuring ethical purchasing practices that don't push all the costs and risks of business down that chain onto the most vulnerable workers at the bottom. I know this looks like a rock concert. It's actually a software developers conference. Drupal, some of you may know it, is an open source software for creating websites. And once a year, all Drupal users come together in a conference, they create code, they patch the code, they improve their collective tool that's in the commons. And then, they, of course, they run their niche enterprises using what they've collectively created. And I love this picture. They're all holding their hand up like this, like a little drop to say, I may be but one drop, but look what happens when we get together. Think of any major corporation, how envious they would be to have such a dedicated and big and creative research and development team in-house. This is happening thanks to open design. And then lastly, a fair tax commitment. So we know that so many companies spend a lot of time optimizing their tax return, paying as little tax as possible in the most strategic countries possible, at the last minute possible. The fair tax commitment, which Lush Cosmetics has signed up to, the first multinational says, merely says we commit to paying the right amount of tax in the right countries at the right time to overcome the tax haven practices that are going on in so many multinational companies. So to me, these are just four examples, illustrations of far more distributive design in business itself. So we need to be distributive by design. What about regenerative by design? Today, we have a linear degenerative economy. We, we take Earth's materials, make them into stuff we want, use it for a while, often once, and then throw it away. And this is pushing us over planetary boundaries. This is what it looks like when we take from Earth's sources deeper and deeper and deforest the Earth's lungs, which are our forests. This is look, what it looks like when we dump the wastes into plastics, into lakes and rivers, or electronics waste into the neighborhood of the world's poorest people. We can't go on this way much longer. How do we transform that? We need to bend those linear arrows around so that resources are never used up, they're used again and again. And this, of course, is the idea of the circular economy. And the essence of it is that materials are divided into two kinds. There's the organic over here. This is allowing nature to do what nature's been doing for billions of years, breaking things back down and regenerating life putting food waste in a food waste bin so it can decompose and come back as compost. But also on the technical side, like this microphone, this stand, the laptops, the lights, all the man-made materials that we have can't be wasted and thrown away. They need to be reused, refurbished, recycled, repurposed again and again. It's an economy that will run on sunlight. So the energy that enables us to send these things around needs to not be fossil fuels, but sun, wind, water, waves, and uh, geothermal. It's an economy in which the principle is that the waste from one process is food for another. In fact, regenerative designers say, there is no such thing as waste. It's just a resource in the wrong place. And I believe it needs to be an economy that's modular and open by design. Uh, and just to illustrate with my favorite example, here are two smartphones. Do the same kind of thing, totally different by design. Because this one's an iPhone. So if it breaks, I have to send it back to Apple because it's glued shut. Glued shut so nobody can get in proprietary control. But this one is a Fairphone made by the Dutch company. And it's, you can see it's transparent, literally and technically, and it says here, yours to open, yours to keep. So if anything goes wrong or needs upgrading, there's a video on YouTube of how to open it, how to upgrade it, just the piece that needs changing, so it's modular. So the essential difference is this is glue closed technology. This is click open technology. And to me, this is the design of the 21st century that we need to have a circular economy. A couple of examples of companies that I find really exciting working in this space. Open Motors. If you buy a car from Open Motors, it will arrive like this, like a wardrobe from Ikea. And they say, if you know what you're doing, you can put it together in less than an hour. So good luck. 
But you can go on YouTube, there's a video showing you exactly how to assemble it because it's open source by design. You can see it's 100% modular. Each piece can be replaced on its own. It's 100% electric. Once that basic chassis is assembled, then it can be customized for a particular market purpose, whether it's an airport buggy or a, an electric streetcar. But then Open Motors thought again and they thought, well, why would we need to sell cars to people? Who wants to own a car? People just want mobility. So now they've shifted their focus. They're making self-driving cars, which instead of being driven only two hours a day, will be driven 24 hours a day, which means that some parts will wear out much, much more quickly, which is all the more important that they're modular by design. So just that worn out part can be replaced. And then here's a Swedish sportswear company called Houdini, who make all of the clothing that they make is either from wool and tensile, which are organic fibers. In fact, they, they got some of it back, put it in a dustbin, turned it into compost, grew some vegetables on top, served it to their customers and said, you're eating your old ski wear, just to make this point of the circular economy. Or they make the clothing from recycled nylon and recycled polyester. So everything is going around a circular loop. And in fact, they're the first company to do what, the, what a planetary boundaries assessment of all the textiles they use in their chain. This is on the web, if anyone's interested, how this company have turned the donut, the social and the environmental into a metric for setting themselves incredibly high standards for the company that they want to be. So I believe we need enterprises that are distributive and regenerative by design if business is gonna help bring us into this space. But what fascinates me is this range of businesses, I think in any sector, whether it's textiles or energy or mobility or electronics, you can think of companies that are every point on that spectrum. And I'm fascinated, why is it? And here I think we need to think not just about the design of the products, but the design of business itself. And this is the last thought I want to share. What is the design of business itself? This to me actually is the most exciting transformation and the most necessary transformation that's happening this century. I think we are in an incredible phase of a psychological drama of the transformation of what business can be and do in the world. Put in the simplest of terms, I think the 20th century was dominated by an extractive mindset that I still read in the business pages and the financial pages and financial reports in the share, you know, the shareholder reports, always asking, one underlying question, how much financial value can we extract from this enterprise? And yet when I talk to the CEOs, the founders, the designers who work in companies like Fairphone, companies like Houdini, like Open Motors, they are asking a completely different underlying question. You can hear it under everything they say and they do. How many benefits can we generate in the way we design this? How many benefits for the community? for our society, for our customers. Financial benefits, for sure, we have to make a profit. Of course we do, because we need to open the doors next year and next month. So we need to turn a profit, but that's not why we're in business. We're in business to actually do something that we see needs changing in the world. And so for me, the, I, I'm, I'm fascinated again, why do these different kinds of companies exist and what explains that difference between them? And here I want to share five business design traits that I use as a lens to be a detective about companies. When I look at any company in the world, or indeed any organization, through this lens of five traits, it really helps me understand why it's doing what it's doing or it's not doing what it's doing. And I, and I offer this to you as an early Christmas present, as a lens for looking at every company, one that you're in, one that you love, one that you hate. It'll help you understand. This is from the work of Marjorie Kelly, a brilliant design, um, corporate analyst. So the first design trait is purpose. What is the purpose of this enterprise? A 20th century car company might have said, oh, our purpose is to be the biggest, biggest brand in four by fours. Open Motors that I just showed to you, their purpose is to democratize mobility. It's, it's a way bigger purpose than themselves, something that they see needs to happen in the world and they create an enterprise that's in service to it. Fairphone was created. Their purpose was to drive labor exploitation out of supply chains of metals. And they realized the easiest, the most powerful way to do that was to start making the phone themselves. So their purpose is to transform 
labor rights in supply chains. So second, governance. How has that company governed its principles, the rules, the practice, the culture that exists in the company? One example, I'll give you the, the Dutch bank Triodos. The, the CEO told me that every Monday morning, we spend the first 45 minutes together, all employees together in one meeting, talking about the purpose of our company. Because that 45 minutes sets the tone for the whole week ahead. But of course, that's the culture of governance. How is it written into the boardroom discussions? What principles drive the kinds of decisions that are made? And then networks, how is the enterprise networked? How does it network with its suppliers and pass on its values to them, but also network with its customers? You can bet that somebody who owns a Fairphone knows a lot about the phone and is totally proud to own this phone. But also, how do you network with people who you might have thought were your competitors and you realize they're your allies? The family is a fantastic example of a network of entrepreneurs who, working together, realize you're stronger together. So how do you make sure it's embedded with these generative values? So governance, purpose, networks. Let's get to the really powerful stuff which lies deepest. How is the company owned? Because whether a company is owned by its employees, by a private family, by private equity, impact investors, venture capital, shareholders, who owns the company is going to profoundly shape what I see as the most important fifth design trait, which is what's the quality of finance coming to that enterprise? And is that finance aligned with saying, we are backing you, we're investing in you because we believe in what you're trying to make happen in the world. We, we commit too to that social environmental value you're bringing about with a fair financial return that we want. Or is that finance actually pulling the company back and saying, well, we want the highest rate of return in the shortest amount of time, deliver. I think we're at a moment in time where so many public companies are in what I call the split personality mode. They've transformed their purpose and their governance and their networks, but they are still owned and therefore pulled back by a very 20th century shareholder mentality. And one example would be Unilever. If you remember, uh, so Unilever have got the sustainable living plan. Paul Pullman, the CEO, has created 50 metrics on social and environmental value, cutting carbon, cutting wastewater, improving health. They network with NGOs like Oxfam, where I used to work, and progressive business alliances, but are still owned by the stock market. And so still vulnerable to the pull of that finance. And in February last year, if you recall, there was a hostile takeover bid of Unilever by Kraft and 3G. Old finance saying, ah, all these nice social and environmental values, we can see a higher return on shares faster. And they almost got taken, almost got taken over. I think there are a lot of companies in exactly this situation. And what I believe actually needs to happen is to turn all those arrows in the same direction. How do we ensure that ownership of enterprise and finance is aligned with these generative values of distributive design, of regenerative design, so that businesses can actually fully be part of bringing humanity into that space where we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. There's so much more to say, but I'm gonna stop right there because I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. There you go. Thank you, Kate. That was an excellent uh, start, I think, to yeah, everything that's in the book. Uh, I had a couple of questions that I, I wanted to pose, and then we'll, we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience as well, based on uh, the book itself. Um, in the chapter, when you were talking about creating to regenerate, one of the examples that you use, an early example really, uh, is the body shop. Mm -hmm. uh, so the body shop was a company that was grown and thrived as a business that was based not just on this net zero idea, but actually how can we generate and how can we give back? Uh, and you also know though that the body shop's founder then goes on to note that one of the biggest mistakes she made was going public. Uh, and because that was what made her beholden to short-term financial interests and it became a, a serious problem. Um, and I can also imagine in the mid to late 1980s that was 
probably an interesting time to be, uh, at least today, I think people don't really want the whole American psycho Wolf of Wall Street uh, idea. It might still exist, but we at least kind of say no in the 80s, a uh, whole different issue. But still diversifying types of funding is important, right? Because it gives you a way to grow without having to necessarily rely only on your cash flows. Uh, are there any specific options out there? And now I'm thinking of things like Eric Reese's long-term stock market, which they're trying to get off the ground, even though it's got its issues as well. Uh, are there things like that that you see that can uh, today uh, be used as these sources of funding, which in the 20th century did allow uh, companies to grow in that way, but without the uh, the short-term downsides. Yeah, so absolutely agree. Companies need to diversify the source of their funds so that they can grow, uh, but have to make sure they diversify not into the hands of an old financial mentality. And I've I've taught with many entrepreneurs, and I'm sure there's many in the room who desperately want to grow. Some partners come in, they come in, they put some money in, and then something about their expectations, their values, you know, we want in 10 years time, we want to get out 10 times bigger. And therefore, no, don't do that nice thing. Actually, you need to cut that corner. You need to push that totally changes the ethos, the purpose, the governance of the company. I've seen that happen so many times. So absolutely inventing the ownership and finance that is aligned with this to me is the great project. Where do you find the impact investors? who are aligned with it. Where, where do we get the conscious capital? Where do you get, for, I mean, there's many things you can do. You can uh, have long-term shareholders. You can have sh long-term shareholdings, have a higher vote than short-term shareholdings. Interesting, I, I was lucky to meet Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever recently, and I said to him, so how, you know, you had this near takeover bid, how are you coping? And he said, well, actually, one thing we're doing is everybody who's employed in Unilever, and all the way down to the factory workers, if they're employees, when they get their wage, they now get a share. And he said, I want our company to be 20% owned by its employees, because that means any hostile bid now has to get 50% of 80% of the shares. That's gonna be much harder. So I thought that was really interesting, using employ partial employee ownership as a means of insulating from the market. But making sure that when that money comes in, it doesn't transform the nature of the enterprise's ambition. B corporations is an example, right? B corps right into their governance and their articles of association. We are delivering returns for shareholders, but not financial returns only. We are committed to social environmental value as well. So you can never say, as a shareholder, I feel you know, you're not delivering my financial returns, you're investing too much in other stuff. I think we're in a period of real innovation in these different kinds of models because we've realized the need. So I'm seeing legal innovations, um, new kinds of funding emerging, and I'm sure there's many people in the room who actually know much more than me about the opportunities and the availability or the shortage. Banks like Triodos that say we are committed to investing in social environmental return. So we want to see that across venture capital, across private equity, across you know long-term conscious capital. An ecosystem needs to emerge of finance. There's a huge ecosystem of finance over there. It's only just beginning to grow over here. And to me, that is the key project to make all of this possible. I, I note that when I was preparing for, for tonight, I went looking to sort of uh, see when we essentially wrote into law the what we've all sort of heard that maximizing shareholder returns is the purpose of the corporation. And in fact, I found out that actually we, there are issues in say Delaware that give an idea that that is actually necessary, but it's not entirely certain. And also the judges are actually quite uh, reluctant to, to question management decisions. If they don't maximize profit, they, there is no, we aren't sending them to jail. I mean, that's clear. Um, and so that was an interesting thing that I said, because I, I, what I was thinking was that, well, we have a, a legal issue to deal with as well, where we need to eliminate this idea that Friedman came up with in 1970 and, and that was sort of fed to us all for the last 50 years. Uh, but in fact, there is a, a question of mentality more so, and it's a strong mentality, right? That, yeah. that idea of maximizing shareholder return, we've, I don't know about all of you, but I was relatively convinced that that was in at least the United States in, in our legal system. So it's interesting, it's, and there's a lot of debate across countries of how much it's a legal obligation and how much is a cultural norm that's developed. There's very much a cultural norm that's developed. But again, there's different laws between countries. So the UK 
has a company law which actually quite clearly, section 172, quite clearly says the responsibility of the company is to deliver returns to shareholders. So it's a very narrow financial law. And I hear whispers that this is going to get rewritten because it's, it's precisely holding us back. Whereas the Netherlands has a company law that says the responsibility of the company is to operate in the long-term interests of the company's stakeholders. Totally different framing. So you need both the law and the not stakeholders. Shareholders. Exactly. We need both the law and the culture of how business is run to move in that direction. Uh, you talked a little bit about fair tax as well in, in the chapter on uh, designing the economy to redistribute wealth. Uh, you note that global taxation is an idea that you think is one that we think seems impossible and yet that you believe to be inevitable. Uh, can you share with us any of the sort of discussions or insights that you've seen as you talk about your book and about this theory, about this philosophy more so than theory, uh, of how you see that emerging? Because it is a serious question of how can we establish global taxation on global companies uh, and essentially not uh, limit them to whatever profit was registered in X country? Can we offshore it everywhere else? Uh, whatnot? But it's a complicated question when even we have problems getting the OECD to, to even just decide on some new norms for the 21st century. Yeah, I don't know how it will happen. What I, but, but, but the first step of making it happen is to make clear the very strong motivation for it happening. So at the moment we have a situation where legislation is divided into lots and lots of countries and we have multinational companies operating across them. So of course they're going to optimize where they pay, how they pay, their transfer pricing. They're also going to use tax havens, right? So all of the world's countries are getting shortchanged by companies in a race to the bottom of, you know, offering lower and lower corporate taxes. And there's a collective action problem around that. So 1% of the wealth is, you know, in that. 1% of the people own half of the wealth. And if you look at who's at the top of the Forbes rich list, these are some very big multinational globally operating companies. It's clear that this isn't working. William Burroughs says, I want to see the manager. And the old system of national taxation just does not fit with the very international business strategies made even more possible by digitization of companies. We need a taxation system that actually is fit for the times. And it seems to me an obvious way of doing it. I don't know how we're going to do it, but let's make the case that we need to do it. I had kind of hoped that you would like talk to someone and knew, oh yeah, this guy is going, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so just before this event started, uh, I was looking at the headlines coming out of the UK today, which were interesting. Don't do that. <laughs> No, because I, I want to take this in a slightly different direction. So could Brexit actually be sort of an anti-GDP moment for the UK and for the world? And so let me explain. So without uh, getting into the actual political aspects that are still, we have no idea if Brexit is going to happen, will there be another, et cetera. Leaving all of that aside, today the report came out saying that essentially growth and GDP are going to be to some unknown extent, damaged by, by Brexit and, and all this. So my question is, could this actually be sort of a Trojan horse where if we posit that Brexit is going to occur, so let's say we know it's going to happen, whether it's a deal, no deal, doesn't matter, et cetera. If Brexit happens, would it be a moment where the UK would be, be able to essentially embrace a new fashion of looking at their economy and judging it that's not based around GDP because specifically GDP is going to get destroyed <laughs> over time. So would it be a way for them to actually say, you know what, guy, we don't care about GDP. We're actually moving to a new thing. So I'm, I'm basically trying to find a, a silver lining to to the situation. And actually that strikes me as one that would be relatively interesting because again, the, the fact is, is that when you read economic headlines, it is about growth. I had the New York Times open as well and it was uh, American growth is doing, it, we, the GDP is our, mm -hmm. our Dimension. shining light. And, and the question becomes, because it's so simple, it's very attractive, right? Politicians love it. It's a, yeah. it's a super easy, uh, way for them to, to discuss these things. So, I get it. 
could could Brexit actually be potentially a good way to move away from GDP? Cannot believe you've lured me into a, onto a stage to talk about Brexit. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's Let's not my do it. fault. The, the headlines are literally every day. Let's do it. Okay. So, the debate that happened around Brexit when the referendum was coming up shows the gap between the political obsession with GDP and what people actually care about, right? A lot of the analysis is will this be better or worse for GDP? And yet that was quite disconnected from what most people were actually motivated by. So, one, you're absolutely right. There's a political obsession and it's a whole other conversation, why we are politically and financially addicted to endless growth, but that's not the way most people are thinking. And go to the Midlands, go to the North, the UK, they'll say GDP growth, it's not my growth. Sorry, you're telling me the economy's growth, it's not showing up in my income, because we've had rising returns in dividends for shareholders and stagnant wages for workers, same story in the US. So number one. Two, I think that both the conser I can't believe you've got me talking about this. I think that both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party are deluded. And which is partly why both of them until this time have been actually gone pro Brexit, even though neither of them were supporting it before the referendum. Because I think the Tories think, oh yes, if we break free of the shackles of Europe, we can have this competitive open market. I mean, they're harking back to Milton Friedman dreams of new trade deals, right? Dream on. But I think also Labour are equally deluded that once we break free from neoliberal Europe, we can have this much more socially welfare-based UK economy. I think they're all, because whichever way it goes, if we end up with Brexit, we still have a divided country. And neither of those parties is going to be able to live out the political dream they want, so we'll always end up hobbled in the middle. But lastly, let me say that if, a, if, if either of those parties think we need to leave Europe in order to get beyond GDP, they're missing the party that's going on. Because right now, there's a new group emerging of governments called the We All Alliance. They were going to first call themselves the We Seven as opposed to the G Seven, but then they thought, actually, we want to be more than seven. So they call themselves the We All Alliance. This is Costa Rica, New Zealand, Slovenia, uh, Scotland, countries that are never going to be part of the G set, G20 because they're not the big boys. So they're saying, let's just go do something more interesting. And they're reframing their economies around well-being. You don't have to leave Europe to do that. You can have a new paradigm and actually have a new national conversation. I so would love the UK, not just Scotland, but the whole of the UK to join that, have far more democratic conversations and say, what do we actually value? I'd invite them to sit around the donut and say, what would this look like in our country? People are popping up and doing that in Amsterdam, in Cornwall. Community groups have taken the donut and started saying, what would it look like to live in this here? So Brexit is not the route away from GDP addiction. I actually think that whether it was a Labour Brexit or a Tory Brexit, it would make those governments all the more addicted to growth because they would darn well have to prove that this was the right thing to do. Oh, I definitely didn't want to imply that they would somehow figure it out <laughs> based no, on no, that. I know but uh, I, I guess a follow up question would have been in which politicians are exactly going to do this?